Morning everyone. So we're going to continue our review into our grade 12 stuff. Uh, this set of notes here I actually prepared for my regular Chem 12s. Uh, so as you step our way through you're going to see some extensions to our IB material. But hopefully this is a nice overview of some of the material that we started looking at since September. Uh, remember to uh, not just be looking at these notes and watching these lessons but also be practicing uh, old exam questions from paper 1 and paper 2. Uh, that'll help you uh, get prepared for the final. Mrs. Sabari and I will be available for uh, answering any questions during our office hours. So. Uh, let's just go on here. This is here chapter 6 on reaction kinetics. Uh, this chapter here on reaction kinetics was all to do with the speed of a reaction. So in chapter 5 we were interested in the energetics, we were interested in the stability, is it spontaneous, is it endothermic, exothermic, are we getting more chaotic, less chaotic. In this case here we're actually looking at how fast the reaction occurs. So say the reaction is spontaneous, does it have a very high activation barrier and is a very slow reaction, particles have really hard time breaking bonds to actually go forwards, or a very quick reaction. So. In general, for a reaction, we're looking at generally reactants becoming products. Make sure you do use an arrow in between here instead of an equal sign. They will ask you this definition here, define the rate of reaction. You cannot use the terms, oh, it's the rate of a reaction, it's the rate of reactants becoming products. Use things like it's the speed, um, speed where the concentration of reactants over time, this one here decreases because reactants are going to be used up, or it's the speed at which your product concentration goes up. So you see I'm trying to avoid the language of just saying rate again, you're trying to come up with another way to define it. Um, so that's the speed there. Sometimes for rates, uh, especially for reactants, because they are decreasing, they are going to put a minus sign, or in words you just say, oh, my reactants are disappearing at this positive rate. Make sure you have units for that there. Uh, in general, we do use concentration on top, so that's why we're going to get the units. This is how quickly your molarity here is changing per second. Again, IB doesn't like this um, molar, this capital M symbol, so they'd rather say, well, molar actually stands for mole per liter, or better yet here, this is going to be mole <coughs> dm to the negative 3 all over seconds, or you can equally well write this all, mole dm negative 3 and as well seconds to the minus 1. Uh, so that's concentration in general. Depending on the actual reaction, sometimes you're, you have many different ways of actually measuring the rate. So here are just some examples of uh, what could go into this change in amount on top. It could be measuring a change in amount. It could be something like grams per second. It could be concentration like we talked about. Uh, concentration can be seen indirectly in two ways. Uh, say, for example, the copper 2 plus ion is blue. So if I have a reaction that generates copper 2 or disappears copper 2, I can see the intensity of the blue color either appear more or disappear more. How quickly that color intensity drops over time would be a measure of rate. We're just tracking something continuous we could be changing. So change in intensity over change in time. Acidity, specifically we'll use uh, pH meters, pH probes. We can track a change in pH. Uh, pH in our acid base chapter, we knew that pH does uh, monitor the H plus concentration. It was in fact the negative log of H plus. But remember, pH is just a ruler. The ruler goes roughly from 0 to 14. There's no saying it can't go beyond into the negatives or up above 14. We saw because of the, it's a logarithmic scale, it gets fairly hard to get uh, fairly past beyond those regions. 7 is the dividing number only at 25 degrees, where we can uh, just uh, assume that is, unless otherwise told. And in this case here, notice the language, if my pH drops, so pH decreases, that means your number is going 7 to 6 to 5 to 4. Notice I'm going into the acidic region. pH decreases is actually another name for getting more acidic, while if I say pH increases, pH increases means I'm going up on the scale, 7 to 8 to 9. Remember, this is a logarithmic scale, so every step is 10 times harder than the one before it. In this case, your pH increases is actually a way of saying more basic. Sometimes people get confused. They just think, oh, uh, pH, oh, that's an acid scale. If pH decreases, it must mean less acidic. Well, in fact, pH is just a ruler. Depending on where I am on the ruler, if the pH number actually drops, we're actually getting more acidic. So just be careful that there, that one monitors the H plus concentration. Aside from that, we can't really uh, come up with a meter that can test like uh, iron concentration or cobalt concentration uh, unless they actually show a color, unless they can track it with a pH probe. Concentration is fairly hard to do. 
Uh, we saw one sort of uh, snapshot of that here. If I did a titration, if I could somehow stop the reaction at uh, many times. So uh, let's say I start off, here's my reaction at zero seconds, nothing's happened yet. If I let the reaction go for 10 seconds and I add something to stop the reaction, basically I get a freeze frame of that, uh, of that um, amounts at that time. And then I can do a titration to figure out, well, what's my concentration right now? I can do the same here. I let the reaction go for, say, 20 seconds. Uh, I can add something to stop the reaction, and I can do a titration. It's just that doing a titration actually takes time and actually destroys the sample. You do need a way to somehow stop the reaction, get a freeze frame of it before you can plot it. So that one's a little bit more tricky, but you can hypothetically do that. Uh, especially if the reactions are endothermic or exothermic, we will see a change in temperature over time. Uh, especially when we're looking at gases, gases respond very drastically to pressure, volume, as well as temperature, depending on how you're setting up the system. An open system is like this one here that's completely uh, uncapped, so any gases that get produced can actually leave. Uh, this was something that we didn't want in equilibrium. For equilibrium, we wanted all the chemicals to still stay around. Uh, but in this case here, if like in our Alka-Seltzer reaction here, if the gas actually leaves, we're going to actually see that the total mass of the complete system drops, and we can track how quickly that uh, grams drops to figure out the, that reaction rate there. Uh, so open system or in a closed system, if I just cap the top here, maybe I do produce gases. When I have more particles it's kind of hitting the sides of the container here, that's just going to build up the pressure, uh, making sure to take care of any safety precautions, things like that, make sure the container is made out of something heavy duty enough. We can track the change in pressure. Uh, so how many increase in atmosphere or bars uh, in time as well. That's another thing I can change. Uh, as we do plot those graphs there, I'm just going to sketch it on the side. Uh, let's say our Alka-Seltzer reaction, make sure you label your axis. We have mass and grams. On the lab, we just did artificially every 5 seconds. There's nothing magical about it. You could have done every 10 seconds. You just want to capture, well, my mass of the beaker and the Alka-Seltzer tablet is something at the beginning. As time goes onwards, we saw that the Alka-Seltzer took a little while to get going. Then it starts getting steeper and then it starts leveling off there. Uh, yes, we only sample the mass and every given five seconds or so, but the whole point of getting a continuous set here is to actually draw a continuous line. We actually want to use our dots. You're just going to eyeball a line. It doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line. So in this case here, we see a curve here. Our instantaneous rate, or our initial rate, because unfortunately we're curved at the beginning, it's a little bit hard to do a slope of a curve. What we do instead is we draw that tangent line. So in this case here, our initial slope our initial slope would be that instantaneous tangent, instantaneous uh, rate. And basically, once you plop down the tangent, the hope is, hopefully, when you're uh, looking really closely to that, maybe the curve here does actually start falling offwards. But if you're really close to that point that we're looking at, hopefully my line uh, basically uh, intersects with the purple graph. Once we have that line there, you're welcome to choose any two points on this tangent that are easy to read on your graph paper, do a rise over run. In that case there, you'll get mass over time and you'll get the rate. If we go on and compare average rate instead, for average rate, I know it was sort of slow to start. That was because the Alka-Seltzer tablet here had some surface area. It took a little bit of time for the water to actually break down the coating. But once that got going, once all the particles are just in solution there, once all the surface is exposed, that's the time I would expect the rate to be fastest. So I would expect that the instantaneous rate here would get steeper and steeper as we go. But as I slowly use up my particles, our collision theory would say, well, there's less particles to actually collide with it now. Now this rate here, instead of being really, really steep, it's going to start shallowing out. Our average rate basically says, I'm going to ignore all that, the speeding up and the slowing down part. Average just says, I'm going to put a point where I start, zero seconds. My reaction looks like it's done over here. I'm going to connect it with the straight line. If instead of really going uh, shallow at first, then steep, and then shallow again, in this case here, if I wanted to get that same mass change, and you gave me on average the same amount of time to do it, uh, if I just do a point to point, I get the slope of that, that's going to be a constant slant, and that's going to give me my rate of reaction over time. Okay. So, uh, especially on a paper three, uh, you might be given some experimental data like this. Make sure you have a ruler with you so you can actually uh, plop down the tangent. Uh, your tangent might actually be different from the person next to you, but that's totally fine. It's just your best uh, guess at what the slant is going to be. Uh, whenever we started taking a look at numbers of this one here, this one here was the mass of the entire system. So in our Alka-Seltzer reaction, uh, we had our Alka-Seltzer tablets. Okay. Uh, one of the products was actually carbon dioxide gas. This was the mass that actually was released. When you actually get the slope, that's actually the mass change of carbon dioxide over time. 
it's good when you have your unit specific to a particular chemical because this CO2 is actually in a balanced coefficient with other numbers. Uh, let's say, for example, I know it's not, but let's say, for example, CO2, uh, one component of seltzer, maybe it's two parts of the base. If I know the grams of CO2, I can use molar mass of CO2, I can get moles of CO2, I can use balanced equation. Because I have the rate expressed uh, in terms of one particular chemical, I can just use a mole ratio to get uh, in between. So hopefully that's a little bit of the number crunching for you here. Uh, let's take a look at the factors that generally affect rates. So things that might cause the reaction to go faster or slower. Uh, these ones here, so temperature is a factor. You need to tell me which direction you want the temperature to go. So if you heat things up, in general, the time drops. In general, you don't need to wait as long because time is in the denominator. As the time for the reaction to proceed actually decreases, the overall rate increases. So we're going to always have this um, opposite relationship here. Uh, when we have a decrease in time, it's inversely proportional with the rate. Uh, concentration as well. Concentration is uh, as it increases, you have more particles that could be in lines of having more surface area. There's more particles that can collide. Uh, for this kinetic molecular theory stuff, we're always looking for two conditions. One is the fact of having sufficient energy. Basically, all reactions here have what's called an activation barrier. We can plot this on an energy level diagram here, energy or enthalpy against time or your reaction coordinate. Remember back in chapter five, we had said, although you may not know exactly what starting energy you have or what ending energy that you have, uh, all we care is over the course of the reaction is an overall gain. In this case here, delta H is gonna be positive, so that's gonna be endothermic. That part there was on chapter five. On chapter six, we're looking at this barrier in between. Turns out, yes, the reactants do have to gain energy to get up to products. Basically, reactants have to steal a bunch of energy to become products. But for any given reaction, there's always an energy barrier. There's like an energy hill in between that I have to overcome. It's actually more than the delta H I need, only particles that are speeding together high, uh, fast enough uh, that can get over this hill have an opportunity to actually get over. So that's the sufficient energy argument here. Essentially, the bigger this barrier gets, the less particles can actually uh, have chance to actually get over. So more in detail here, we do this using collision theory. Uh, we know uh, particles have to be in contact, so they have to be put in the same container. The reason for that is particles actually have to collide to actually have a potential of actually sharing uh, or even uh, breaking bonds, forming bonds. What's gonna happen here is as particles are on a collision course, the electrons are the first things I see. The other electrons, those like charges hate each other. So they're gonna experience a repulsive force. This repulsion force is gonna try to uh, keep them apart. Unfortunately, because the particles were already zipping so uh, quickly, essentially what's gonna happen here is that force is just gonna be used to slow things down. As I slow things down, I know I drop in kinetic energy. My uh, conservation energy law basically says the energy had to go somewhere. If I'm actually slowing down, I don't really wanna go and actually collide with this particle here, I'm actually gonna pick up some potential energy. That potential energy is what we plot on this potential energy diagram here. As particles are in a collision course, the chemicals here try to trade in their kinetic for potential. If at first when they came in, they didn't uh, have enough, they've already collided, they've gained enough potential energy, they didn't quite get up to the top of the hill, that's it, they're just gonna bounce off and repel away and then trade that potential back for kinetic. It's only the really, really fast moving particles on both sides. If I had a ton of kinetic energy, I'm gonna trade in a ton of kinetic, gain a ton of potential that I potentially can get all the way up to the top. Uh, they really like asking this question here, define this activation uh, barrier. I uh, wonder if I have it below here. Uh, so activation barrier, this hill, so that one there, I'm gonna call it the EA or the AE if you like. The activation barrier, you have to mention this term here, it's a minimum energy. Sure, if you have a ton of energy, if the particles are moving really, really quickly, of course they can get over the barrier. But activation barrier here is the least the particles can be moving at. Uh, in grade 12, we like using the terminology, minimum energy required to form the activated complex. The activated complex is a temporary molecule, it's called the transition state. The activated complex is at a really high energy state. Because we're high energy, it means that we're very low stability. And that means we're very temporary. We're not gonna last for very long. You actually can't really isolate this here, but activation energy is from the energy that you have all the way up to the top. It's always gonna be a positive number because it's a positive energy barrier. Whether we do the forward reaction or the reverse barrier, I can say the EA of the reverse reaction, it's always from the energy that I'm having dotted over all the way to the activated complex or transition state. So 
the Hebden likes doing this uh, sort of a comparison here. I don't particularly like it, but basically what it's saying, uh, it's actually tracking for you the number of particles that are traveling at any given kinetic energy. Basically, I have fast-moving particles here, slow-moving particles down here. Basically, at any given temperature, on average, the particles are moving at some slow rate. In general, that may not be big enough for how big this activation barrier is. As I look at the particles inside any container, we're going to have some particles going fast and some particles going slow. As they get faster and faster, we're actually going to get less and less particles that actually have faster and faster speeds. In fact, like we just mentioned, it's only the ones that have beyond that minimum activation barrier. It's only the really fast moving particles that can collide. It's only that uh, shaded region that actually has enough of that minimum energy to get over that hill there. Uh, we talked about here as a rule of thumb, in general, if I have a slow reaction, if I up the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius, usually that doubles the rate. Of course, you can argue here what constitutes a slow reaction, uh, what do we mean double the rate, but that's just something that comes out of the math here. As we heat things up, we expect all the particles to heat up. The slower particles, on average, is going to be a little bit warmer of a temperature. This curve here is just going to push, be pushed over a little bit here. And what we're going to have is actually twice the number of particles that are beyond that activation barrier that can actually react. In the past, when we did this in class, we actually had this number and kinetic energy on the side. They just toppled this curve here on the side so you can match it up, uh, the y-axis, y-axis. Uh, so that one there was that energy argument here. The other argument, say concentration, if I add more particles, sure, some of those particles will be fast, some of those particles will be slow. We're actually not changing the energy. That's a good thing to track for you. The only time we change energy is if we change the temperature. All the other features are probably going to be due to uh, correct geometry, having a proper arrangement. So especially when we're talking about breaking bonds and forming bonds, a six reaction between uh, H2 and Cl2 again, Looking at what bonds need to break, in this case here, these diatomic molecules, the HH and the ClCl have to collide together. They're supposed to be forming an HCl bond and an HCl bond. If they come in with this geometry, the atoms are already close together that basically the electrons can fairly easily rearrange. I can start slowly forming that new bond there. If instead the hydrogens actually came in, HH and ClCl actually came in like this, you would actually need an extra amount of energy to twist the hydrogen in place so that the H and the Cl are in the correct geometry so that I can actually form those nice bonds there. Because that's going to require a little bit more energy, the energy barrier for that will be slightly higher. There were only two times that we saw the activation barrier change. In this case here, if I have bad geometry, yes, there's extra energy that needs to be twisting it, so that would increase the, the activation barrier, that limit that I need to actually get over. The other one was catalyst. Aside from that, the activation barrier always stays the same. So whether you change temperature, whether you increase the pressure, whether you swap out the chemicals or whatever, the barrier for the reaction is always constant, except for those two that I mentioned, maybe bad geometry and maybe a uh, catalyst. So there's concentration here. If you have to, if you're going on nothing and you're just trying to compare which is fast, which is slow, in general, I'd expect solids, which have particles that are sort of just vibrating in place, not a lot of energy to start off, compare it to liquids and gases sort of in between, and then we have aqueous. Aqueous state here, the particles are sort of in solution and colliding with one another here. I'd imagine that the collisions, there's going to be way more collisions in the aqueous case, and also because the particles themselves are quicker, I'd expect more of them would have uh, the sufficient energy argument. Uh, surprisingly, uh, aqueous is actually faster than gas. That's because aqueous actually has charges. So aqueous means uh, dissolved salts. So I have some positives, some negatives. On top of the particles already in close vicinity in the liquidy aqueous state, because of these charges, there's actually an electrostatic force that brings the charges together. That could also control which particles actually collide also have an impact on the correct geometry. Careful, this rate here is actually different from the rate that we'll see in chapter 7, at least based on rate, uh, it's uh, in that order there. So if I have nothing else to go on here, let's say I have A solid and 2B as an aqueous, this becomes 3C as a solid. Let's compare this with uh, 4D as a liquid and 5E as a gas, F as a solid. Our reaction rate will only depend on these things. When we get to our rate law here, our rate only depends on the reactants. 
So in both cases here, I tried to trick you here. I actually put a solid on this side here. That doesn't matter. Yes, I know solids are slow, but I'm not looking for these guys to recombine and actually go backwards. I'm actually looking for the reactors to go forwards. Essentially, what I'm comparing here is I'm going to say, oh, aqueous here is the fastest rate. I might expect that this rate here will be faster than the other one. The other one also takes more particles. That could be harder. We might need a reaction mechanism for that part there. So if you have nothing else to go on, you just look at those uh, initial uh, states there. Uh, and then especially if they do talk about changing conditions, higher temperature, higher concentration. If I have higher pressure, specifically we're looking at gases. Remember gases, uh, pressure and volume are inverses. So sometimes I may not ha actually have a box that contains pressure, but I can actually squeeze the box. If I tell you anything in terms of volume, the opposite happens to pressure. So if I squeeze the box, I lower the volume. Also inverse relationship with pressure. Those ones there specifically are for gases because liquids and solids are very incompressible. They don't really respond as drastically uh, to those conditions. Uh, nature of reactants is sort of some chemicals really just don't want to bond and it's, you can't force them to bond. They're just never going to bond. That has to do with how strong the bonds are, how many bonds are you actually trying to break. Uh, as well as a catalyst, we're going to see a catalyst will always speed up things. If you want the equivalent that slows down things, in biology we call them inhibitors. They actually slow down things for the same uh, way. And essentially here, make sure you know this definition. They provide an alternate mechanism. They provide a different pathway, a uh, different detour. It does get us from the very same start and the very same end, so the delta H doesn't change, but it's going to be a path that actually has a lower activation barrier. So some of those particles here, which at first actually didn't have much energy, if the barrier itself is lowered, right? remember this is the one of two times that actually barrier changes, then again, I have more particles that have enough energy. Those more particles can actually really easily get over the rate, uh, get over the energy barrier, and therefore the rate is now faster. So hopefully that recaps uh, some of that potential energy, uh, this kinetic energy distribution stuff with you. Uh, activated complex for us, we were calling it a transition state. A transition state here is in the process of reforming bonds. So you might say here, this is in the process of rearranging bonds. So you cannot isolate a transition state. This is different from an intermediate that we'll see in the next step here uh, with what's called a reaction mechanism. So this is the last little bit here in chapter six. So reaction mechanism, uh, that word mechanism actually refers to the actual pathway. The actual ordering, what goes first, step one, step two, step three, that ends up making up the overall or that ends up making up the net reaction. You are never asked to predict a whole mechanism from scratch. People can do a whole master's thesis or try to come up with a mechanism. But given most of the mechanism, they could ask you for one uh, overall. So for example, if I gave you this is step number one, step two, step three, I might ask you here, well, what's the overall reaction? What happens after all of this? First thing for you to be careful of here is each and every one of these steps here has its own activation barrier because each one is a chemical reaction itself. So if we plot this against potential energy, so far I've been using time. In general, we call this here a reaction coordinate. Coordinate just means an axis. And essentially, I prefer reaction coordinate. Essentially, that says we start off with reactants on this side and we gradually get to products as you go left to right. In any sense, when we want to go reverse reaction, we can go products back to reactants. So in this case here, even though each of these steps here, we call each step an elementary process, each step is a basic step, each step will actually have an energy hill. So I'm just going to make this up here. I don't necessarily know which are endo, which are exo, but not knowing what the starting energy, let's say the first one here was uh, endo. So maybe that one there was the first reaction. I'll color code the next reaction here. Maybe the next part here was exo. That's the blue reaction. And let's do one in purple. Uh, maybe the other one here ends up doing this. Okay. Right. You'll notice that each and every one of these uh, reactions, even though I call it a basic step, each one actually has an energy barrier. This is activation barrier for the first reaction here. <clears throat> EA1, uh, EA2. you notice that EA is always from the energy that I have as reactants in that step up to that top of the hill, the activated complex, the transition state, will be the tops of these hills here. For the activated complex, you essentially smush the two together. Let's say OCl minus runs into H2O. I'm going to have OCl minus and then H2O. Imagine just smushing those together. That means I'm going to have two H's, two O's, and a Cl overall with a negative charge. Usually we use a like an equal and a hashtag over there, uh, that to indicate transition state. This is a temporary thing that actually doesn't last for very long. It's really high energy, it's really unstable. 
and the activation energy is the barrier that's needed to end up creating that state there. This is different from, say, a catal uh, This is different from an in intermediate. So, for example, when I actually look at this, when I try to actually plot out a net reaction, yes, I know these are all three separate reactions, but these three are all what would be reactants on the individual steps. Those should be on the left side. On the right-hand side here, these should be on the right-hand side products. Uh, if I see any chemicals that appear on both sides, they actually cancel out. So, for example, I end up creating OH minus. I didn't put OH minus in step number one, and yet OH minus got created, and it gets destroyed in step number three. It doesn't have to be necessarily the step right afterwards, but if it gets used up in some later on step, we're going to call that instead an intermediate. An intermediate, in this case here, it was produced in one step. I guess I should add hydroxide also as an intermediate here. It got produced in some early step and it got consumed. Hydroxide actually is a chemical that I can isolate. Hydroxide is actually a product in reaction number one. It's just that it doesn't appear in the overall because it gets used up overall. So. And whatever appears on the right side gets canceled out on the left hand side here. Hydroxide is an intermediate. It is different from the transition state, which is just happening to break and form bonds. So other things that would constitute intermediates in the step here, I make a CLOH. CLOH gets used up. That gets canceled out. And similarly here, I get an IOH in the second step here. The IOH cancels the IOH in this step. Whatever has not canceled out uh, ends up in the overall. I notice there's an example here. Well, wait a second. Water actually goes in and water actually comes out. We cannot call water a intermediate because I don't have a reaction that produced water early on. Water is something I purposely put in. And yet we don't see water in the overall reaction because this one here did cancel out. Left side cancel right side. Instead of being created first and then used up, this is something that was put in on purpose. So it was put in to be consumed and then later on produced. That one there defines for us a catalyst. Without water, step one couldn't happen, although the net reaction might still be able to occur, it won't be able to happen via this pathway, which I would assume as the uh, faster pathway, a lower activation uh, pathway. So just care for those definitions there, identifying catalysts, identifying uh, intermediates there. Uh, cancel those out and we end up with our net overall reaction. The thing that they really like asking here is, what happens to the delta H? Well, for delta H, regardless of which path I took, I still start off at the same ingredients, I still end up at the same conditions, my delta H overall is unchanged. So I still get from start to finish. This is sort of the Hess's Law stuff we saw in chapter five, uh, but there we go. Because this reaction here ends up taking place in three different steps, uh, it's bound that one of these rates here would actually be faster. In this case here, they actually say this one here is the slow step. The name for that slow step here is called the RDS, or the rate determining step. This one here is the step that ends up controlling, that ends up monitoring whether this reaction can go fast or slow. So though all three of these reactions here will have their own individual activation barrier, I might actually conclude here for the slowest step, the slowest step would be the one with the highest activation barrier. So actually my diagram is incorrect. I would imagine that this slow step here actually needs to be quite a bit larger. So that's the slowest step. Step one and step three happen just like that, but we're waiting on the slowest step, which is why when we get back to the rate loss stuff here, we actually end up uh, trying to do the kinetics of just uh, that slowest step. So uh, let's just throw over here. We're gonna just recap a little bit uh, on rate expressions. Uh, so let's say I propose a mechanism for you here. I'm gonna give you A plus B becomes AB. I'm gonna step step two. So step one, step two, I'm going to add, uh, give you the overall reaction here. Uh, I'm going to have A plus B plus X <coughs> uh, becomes AX. Sorry, let's do this again. Uh, A plus X becomes AX. All right. So let's say that was given to you. Again, you're noticing I'm not having to come up from scratch. Uh, but in this case here, I've given you most of it. I'm just asking you for this uh, unknown step here. So you can do this by sort of elimination here. I have an A on the side, perfect. Uh, I have a B that went in, but I don't see a B come out. So I would expect then, therefore, a B should be in step number two. That would then cancel out. You should be able to recognize that that there is a catalyst. Uh, I have AB, that's a product in step number one, and yet I don't have AB as a product in the overall reaction. That means an AB had to be here. So that cancels out. In this case here, that's an intermediate. We also have an X that goes in, so the X is also another reactant. Because X wasn't canceled out at all, it also shows in the overall, and therefore we get our overall equation. So, so far what I've done here is I've said, just sort of process of elimination here, 
Well, reaction 1 and reaction 2 is supposed to give me my net reaction. If you want to be really elegant, you can actually say, well, since I'm looking for reaction number 2, I can take the net reaction minus reaction number 1. If I minus reaction number 1, that's sort of like adding the opposite. So if I try to do this in the math here, I can go a plus x becomes ax. That's my net reaction. I'm going to imagine adding a negative 1, adding the opposite of reaction number 1. Reaction number 1 had a plus b on the left-hand side. Now I'm going to put it on the right-hand side to go a, b here. And in this case here, I am just doing an addition. I'm not doing the puzzle anymore. I'm not figuring out who canceled out or whatnot. In this case here, I'm just going to just add these two. Imagine I'm trying to do the overall. The a cancels the a. Uh, I'm going to end up with here... Uh, sorry, I missed... Oh, sorry, this is a, b here. Uh, and in this case here, I get, well, uh, x and a, b needs to become... Uh, what I do wrong here? A plus B. Um, uh, just B. Uh, I should end up with an AX. Uh, a plus X is AX. And then AB, A plus B. X, AB. Sorry, I know what I did. No, so I need to have a AX come right here. So. That's actually a good double check here. Oh, I actually did that thing wrong here. I actually should end up with an uh, AX on that side here, and that leaves you with the AX on this side here. Okay. So there's our reaction uh, mechanism there. Uh, we're told one of the steps is slow. You cannot predict just by eye which one's going to be slow just by looking at uh, what are actually combining, because I'm not sure how strong these bonds are. But if I'm told one is a slow step, I can identify this is the RDS. This one here is going to be the one with the highest activation barrier. When we get into actually a little bit of the math of this, we actually use this using the rate law. Careful, the rate law was different from the KEQ expression. For your typical, they call this here a rate expression. So they say write the rate expression for this equation. I'm going to be looking for rate, the actual speed. That speed there is going to be measured in molar per second. This is going to equal to some rate constant. This part here de uh, depend on Arrhenius uh, later on. And then it just multiplied by the concentrations. In general, I wanted to say something like, oh, it's chemical A power to M, uh, B power to the N here. Be really careful here. It's really tempting. Be really careful. These ones here, although in the KEQ thing that we did in Chapter 7, uh, these actually follow the coefficients. These ones here uh, are not uh, always the coefficients. And in fact, the best way to memorize that here uh, these ones here can only be experimentally determined. So that's when we did our method of initial rates. We compared, well, situation number one, if I double A, what happens to the rate? I tried to do some math to solve for this M and N, and that's because the M and N doesn't necessarily follow the uh, coefficients. The only time that it actually does follow the coefficients is if I actually know the mechanism. So like in this reaction, I know the mechanism. I know what actually collides. It's not just going to be A collides with X. Uh, it's actually A collides with B in the first step. So the rate uh, expression for the first step would be the speed of this first reaction is K, A to the 1, B to the 1. The reason why I can do 1s here is because these come from the elementary process. If it came from my net reaction, you are not allowed to take these numbers up into the powers. So from the mechanism, if I actually know what's physically colliding, yes, we can do this here. And in this case here, the overall order, the overall um, n plus n is overall order 2. Uh, and we can call this one here a bimolecular reaction. Okay. Uh, for the second one here, I actually am more concerned with the second reaction because this is the slow step. If I were to do the rate law for this overall mechanism, I would say, well, it's basically a step two. Rate is going to be some rate constant. The chemicals in step two were AB raised to the power M, X raised to the power N. In this case here, remember, this is the elementary process. This is the basic step. Physically, AB does collide with X. And because they collide together, I can use the one and the one up into the powers. Like I said, in general, you can't do that unless we know the mechanism. Unfortunately, though, you'll notice in our overall, AB actually doesn't exist. AB was actually an intermediate that came out of step number one. We're actually going to use this first part here. Well, A and B was used to create AB. We're going to actually substitute that there. A and B end up making this guy. And therefore, our rate law overall, rate is equal to K, A to the 1, B to the 1, and X to the 1.
So in general, the M and the N have to be defined some other way. We have to do that method of initial rates, uh, that whole table, uh, those sort of practice questions there. But in this case here, if I do know the mechanism, if I physically know what's colliding with which, uh, I can actually figure out uh, what the uh, orders are just from the coefficients. Uh, you can verify this for yourself here. They really like asking you the question, what units are for K? Well, depending on what powers you end up with in the problem, sometimes order one, order two, and whatnot. Uh, in general, what I do is I say, well, rate on the left-hand side is supposed to be a molar per second. Whatever your order is, let's do it for this question here. In this case here, whatever the units for k are, they have to cancel out everything a, b, and x does and leave you with m over s. So in this case here, this is actually third order. So the a has a molar per second. <coughs> the b also has a molar per second. Uh, the c also has a molar per second. So that's the right-hand side here. Well, basically, k needs to cancel out two of these. So in this case here, I would say, well, k, uh, k would need to have a molar squared on the bottom. The molar squared would cancel these two. And then we'll have a second square on top would cancel these two. Like I said, IB doesn't like this molar here. So you can rearrange that bottom part here. Second squared mole per decimeter cube, uh, all squared. Second squared mole squared dm to the 6. And then we can just flip that up there. Well second squared dm, uh, that one's just uh, in the top there, and then moles to the negative 2. If you want to verify this for yourself here, those of you that like equations, if we call q equals to m plus n plus whatever other orders that you have, if q is the overall order, you can write down the units of k, this one here that we're going to end up with, the units of k is actually mole per decimeter cube, uh, but it's taken to the power of 1 minus q, all over seconds to the minus 1. That's another formula that I wouldn't memorize because it's easy enough just to uh, plot it down as we just did there. Yeah. Uh, make sure you can study some of these things here graphically. So two different ways of showing the graph here. One is plotting. This is that initial rates analysis. We did this with numbers. Initial rate against the initial concentration. Uh, so far we've done zero order, first order, second order here. If we're zero order, it means that the rate just depends on k. Because it just depends on k, it doesn't care what your starting concentration actually is. Whatever concentration to the 0 is actually 1. So in this case here, regardless of your starting concentration, your rate is equal. On this graph here, it's just going to be a flat line. If I plotted this 0 order here on actually a concentration versus time, this is the other way of plotting it. This is tracking, sure, we are going to slowly lose chemical A because it is a reactant, but because it doesn't change as I lose A, we're going to have a constant slope. We're going to start from 100% here, and we're going to just steadily drop. Regardless, oh, I'm actually half the concentration, well, my slope, my slant, my rate actually didn't change. So that there is a zeroth order reaction. So that's something that doesn't participate in the rate determining step. If I'm a first order reaction, the rate is K, uh, let's do B to the power 1 the rate actually does depend on the concentration. So half-life would be a really good example of this one here. Because it does depend on concentration, but because these ones here are proportional, as the concentration is high, the rate is high. Concentration is high, rate is high. As the concentration steadily drops off, the rate gets lower and lower. In this case here, we get a proportional relationship. That implies first order. For our half-life graph, we might start off at the same ingredients. Because I have the highest concentration at the beginning, my rate will be really steep at first. But as I steadily start losing chemicals, as I'm now down to half, my rate is now a little bit slower, my slant is now a little bit slower, I'm actually going to fall down this way. So that one there is going to be first order. And let's compare this uh, to rate as second order. So bimolecular reaction, a second order reaction will be even steeper here. Yes, it's going to depend on concentration, but because of that square, right, this parabola-like shape, we're going to end up with a parabola going like this. So as the concentration drops off, the rate is going to drop off much quicker at first. And in this case here, we're going to actually get a much steeper line. A little bit hard to see, uh, but that's going to be a second order reaction. So make sure you can analyze some of these uh, in terms of the uh, rate graphs as well. And lastly, we looked at the rate order using um, the table method initial rates. We're going to now look at rate constant. Remember for the rate constant here, we have a guy called Arrhenius's equation. Arrhenius equation, he had k uh, through a pre-exponential factor here, e to the negative ea over rt. This formula here is on your data booklet. And all we really see in general is the rate constant, 
Remember, this is not the KEQ. We'll talk about that in the next lesson here. This rate constant is going to be some measure of the energy barrier. This is that minimum activation barrier to actually get over that hill. But we're going to see that it's inversely related to that te uh, temperature there. Actually, with this negative, it actually makes them proportional. The higher the temperature, you're going to see that the higher the rate constant gets. Uh, the rate constant is only temperature dependent, which is why when you change concentration, you change pressure, this K value won't change. Uh, there was two ways of actually sort of using this equation here. First was a graphical method. We did some derivations in class. You can check your notes. We ended up coming up, if I took a natural logarithm of this K, we ended up with negative EA over R, 1 over T plus ln A. In that case there, we can actually plot a graph again. Uh, this graph here might actually go into the negatives. So if we plot ln k as our vertical axis, so this one here is ln k, if I plot it against 1 over temperature, 1 over temperature on this side, we're going to end up with a straight line because Ea is a constant, R is the gas constant, 8.31 joule per kelvin mole. Uh, temperature has to be in kelvin, and then ln a is just going to be your intercept. Usually this graph here is down here. We end up with this, and then essentially we can say, I know it's going to be a straight line because I have y is equal to mx plus b. From the slope, the slope m is actually going to be negative Ea over r. So given this graph here, calculate the slope, calculate the rise over run, multiply the rate constant, and divide by negative. That gives you uh, a quantitative measure of the activation barrier. And if you do want this pre-exponential factor, the pre-exponential factor deals with uh, your collision frequency. It specifies a few more aspects of how this uh, is going to happen. And then we're going to have the y-intercept is actually be long of a. That's one way the question can be worded. If you're given this graph, that's the significance of the slope, and that's the significance of the y-intercept. Uh, the other sort of formulation of this, if I give you two temperatures, again, we did the derivation class. Uh, let's say this is the first uh, way of doing it. Second way of doing it here, we actually derive this expression here. Uh, the logarithm of k's at two different temperatures is actually going to be Ea over R. We had flipped the binomial, so I got rid of that negative. 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. So say we weren't given a graph, uh, actually plotting it out, extra, uh, interpolating it for many different ratios. If you're just given uh, the k and two temperatures, I can use this expression to find uh, k1 if I know the activation barrier, or if I know the k1, I can use this to find Ea. This one here is a more algebraic way of solving it uh, rather than doing a graph. Okay? Uh, so that's a quick overview of chapter 6. Okay? Uh, if you have any questions, do let us know. Thanks.